Yo, what's up, 40 Waters? You like that? That's a, that's a term I literally just came up with during the theme music. 40 Waters. I don't know if that's going to stick. Hope you're doing well. Welcome to another episode of 40 Watt Podcast. This is Philip coming at you. We're going to get the housekeeping out of the way early. Y'all know I don't like to talk for too long about this kind of stuff, but it is important. So remember, if you are listening to us on a podcasting service, please rate and review the podcast. Share it with your friends. Tell other people you know that like guitar and music and, in, and other instruments. I've had violinists on here. I've got a couple of piano players are going to come on here eventually. Uh, might even uh, slum it a little and get a drummer. We'll see how it goes. You never know. Uh, sorry to you drummers out there. Um, but please rate and review us wherever you listen to this podcast. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, thank you. Please uh, hit the subscribe button, hit the thumbs up button. And uh, if you want to know when I'm doing things, hit the bell icon so you'll get notifications. Uh, leave a comment or the algorithm. You can't see my finger, my air quotes. Um, I hate things like that, but it is what it is. We're, we're, you know, those that create digital content are slaves to the algorithm. Other people won't find it if you don't help us. Um, you can find us on Instagram. Find me on Facebook, 40 Watt Podcast on both of those. Uh, you can also support the show if you would like. There are two ways you can show your support for the show. One is go over to our Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash 40 watt podcast. There will be a link in the show notes or in the video description um, where for as little as three dollars a month or for as much as you want to give, um, you can help support this show. Help me cover um, hosting costs. You can help me cover service fees like StreamYard and the. 25% of the proceeds from uh, uh, Patreon at the end of the year, I donate to charity. In December, I'll be donating 25% of 2021's proceeds to St. Jude Children's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. It's a charity I really, really believe in. I raise money for them every year. I've run the St. Jude Marathon twice now. Uh, plan to run it again this year if my knees will let me. We'll see. Uh, all that pandemic weight that I gained is making it a little harder to get back into running. Um, so... Go to patreon.com 40 watt podcast, or if that's not your speed, if you want t-shirts or you want a hoodie or you want a sticker or you want a coffee mug, I think I've got those up there too. Go to our Teespring store. That is also in the links below. You can buy all sorts of cool things. And if you don't see it on there, tell me what you want. Maybe I'll get it printed, get it made. Uh, you order that's print on demand, which is great for me. I don't have to keep a ton of inventory. So go to those if you want to support the show. I really appreciate it. Under three minutes. Done. All right. So this week on the show, as you've seen in the description by now, I've got Jesse from Rude Tech out of Nashville, Tennessee. Going to talk. Yeah. So Jesse, thanks for coming on. I'm going to get. So I have actually been on your email list for a long time now. Oh, really? Yes. Because I remember I remember seeing your pedals on Instagram back before I even started the 40 watt podcast Instagram on my own personal pod Instagram, which is sadly neglected ever since I made the 40 watt podcast because it's a full time job keeping that Instagram <laughs> going. Um, Dude, but I remember good. seeing them. They look so badass. Thank, they, you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, you um, uh, and, and forgive me, I, I sort of know a little bit because uh Zach Royal, shout out to Mythos Pedals, uh, has been talking about you a little on the Dipped in Tone podcast because I know you're working with him as well now. Yeah, so we'll I talk just about that. To that. Yeah. Yeah. But like, so I'm going to stop talking so you can talk, but it's, it's mostly a point that just the look of your pedals is so different than so many other things out there. They really drew me in. So I've been getting your emails for a long, long time, and you're one of the few emails I haven't like unsubscribed from. <laughs> Thank so you. I really appreciate it? that. Yeah, I used to work for this e-commerce company that would like help small businesses collect more emails on their sites and um, reach out to people. Like once I have their email, what do they send? So like I would agonize over this stuff for clients and I would never implement it myself for my own business. And I've finally started to take my own advice and like, you know, if, if somebody likes your brand, they want to engage with you. So don't feel self-conscious about sending out an email. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And and it, it's funny, a lot of people, it's email is almost thought of now by some people the same way like postcards used to be about advertising, oh, yeah. you know, but oh, email sure. is still a way people are, are getting out there and finding customers and getting these emails and uh, people are seeing it. Repetition, they see it over and over and over again. I keep almost yeah. buying one. I'm just, I, we're, you're going to end up getting me on the, the big muff train, but I'm just not there yet. 
Well, if you're on the email list, you're going to get an email on Tuesday, I think, that I'm about to do uh, free shipping for two weeks, I think it is. But, uh, yeah, every time I get a big re um, restock, I always, like, you know, do a little something small. And I call my mailing list the lab rats. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm a scientist and I run experiments on you and, you know, do giveaways just for the list. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I've, seen, I've seen the really cool stuff on the list, and I've entered a few of those giveaways. Never won, but that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, I've only I've only <laughs> ever won one gear giveaway my entire like musician life. I won a paranormal bass uh, EQ from Seymour Duncan once. Well, and you could do a lot worse. I, yeah. Oh, I used that thing for a long time, for a yeah. really long time. It it was the way that I made my P bass. Uh, since it has very, very passive, very minimalist controls, it gave me active tone shaping, and it was nice. it's crazy cool. Uh, there's a lot of others out there now, but I think if you, if you're looking, they're not that they're not that hard to find on Reverb. They're not not expensive, and they're really good units. Well, it's gonna get the 40 watt bump now. Yeah, it's yeah. gonna be expensive now. You're gonna get Great. Two, two extra search. No, <laughs> so. Um, we'll see. Maybe one day I can, I can drive, uh, prices of uh, things up by five or $6. Um, so your pedals have like this very distinctive look and, and Zach talked about it. Uh, basically they look like control panels for fighter jets in a way they look yeah. like, yeah, they look crazy. Yeah. Thank you. I am a very like science oriented math oriented guy so it's very difficult for me to make something look good like i can tell you what i don't like but i can't tell you how to fix it so i just was like all right how can i just offload all this work how can i make this work have been done already and um this specific pedal that you're talking about is three versions of a russian muff that i really like the civil war version uh, black muff and the green muff and I wanted to have them all in one housing but you you remember like uh, there were all those rumors back when I was in like high school that a muff was made out of old um, Soviet tank parts and yep. you know, there are new ones that you can get at new stores like Mars Music and, and uh, <laughs> stuff like that and, Smart but and those are made in the U.S., but there used to be ones made out of tanks. So with this, I was like, what if it was made out of a MiG fighter? And then I just took pictures of MiGs and was like, all right, where can I find this exact knob? Where can I find this exact toggle guard? How can I get a metal face panel so it looks like it was ripped off the side of the controls or something? That's so cool. And so I tuned into you do Instagram lives fairly, fairly regularly. And they're not yeah, like I've been trying to be better about that. Yeah, they're not scheduled, but they happen. I get the notification and one I chimed in and you were doing the stamping of the serial numbers. Yeah. You stamp them yourself. That's pretty yeah. crazy. I didn't used to for the first ones. I, uh, I just had them uh, serialized from the printer and I would like agonized over how much time does it take to stamp these numbers how much money is it costing me it's like i have all these spreadsheets and i was like all right is it worth it to pay myself x amount of dollars to stamp these itself and i was like just doing all sorts of scientific calculations like and then when it comes to looking at graphics i'm like okay well i guess that's a cool t-shirt I'll, I'll put it on the side i don't know whatever get it off my plate <laughs> But I would just rather like live with a calculator in my hand, I guess. I, you know, that's the way you have to do it, though. I, my mom, uh, used to do. Um, she was a she was a nurse. Then she had a she had a sh a surgery that messed up her shoulder, so she couldn't she couldn't do nursing anymore because you needed to be able to lift patients and do things that she just couldn't do anymore. Right. So she started. Uh, cooking cottage industry out of her house she would cater things she would uh you know sell frozen meals that kind of thing and i remember having to sit her down and have a real conversation about the prices of her food i was like yeah you need to sit down calculate your costs like your just raw costs and then you're she was not taking into account the time it took her to cook yeah. in her i'm like no 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 you have to your time is valuable and yeah, I go through the where, same thing. Yeah, it's there's like you like to do that thing. Why get paid for it? 
Yeah, even yeah, exactly. Even if you like doing it, there's a time where you have to make that decision. Am I losing money doing this myself mm. rather than paying someone to do it? Yeah. And it, it's that soft budgeting that is so hard for people starting out in businesses. Uh, I used to I. Uh, in between jobs, I did some uh, minor business consulting for a friend of mine who was in the food industry, and he was he was having real trouble uh, getting his funding straight, like getting his money straight, um, because he was a brilliant cooking mind. He he studied in some great restaurants under some great chefs, and he was a, he's a great artist. He's a painter. But he really struggled getting his budget in place, getting, you know, calculating the money around his food. And so uh, and I've done that for a few other folks at this point. And it's it's really interesting to see people who don't know how to value what goes into making something when they start asking how much they want to sell it for. Yeah. Because there's pressure to sell because you, especially if you're brand new at it, there's pressure to sell at a rate that people will buy. If they don't know who you are. Yeah. And then you don't know what they will buy at. And like, oh, well, I always tell people if they're having trouble with this, like it, it's not up to you. It's going to be up to the customer. So how soon can you get like 10 people on the phone and just ask their opinion or like yeah. take somebody out to coffee and just say, hey, I'm going to buy you a cup of coffee. If you'd like look at pictures of my pedal or just like hold my pedal in your hand and see what you think it it costs. Yeah, it, that's a brilliant way to do it. And I think there was a point, I, this is one of those where I, I'm, I'm a librarian. I talk about it on the podcast. We end up talking about books on my podcast all the time. Um, but, and we're, I, I've got one I'm going to bring up, but. I'm going to, I'm going to plug my Goodreads before oh, the end of the. Yes. I gave up on Goodreads because my list got too long. I just. I just okay. Stopped. I got a system for this. I got, I add everything I hear about to my goodreads i'm a freak for this stuff <laughs> but then i have three different shelves one x recommended two x recommended and then i have see if you can guess three x recommended yes you did it it's three x <laughs> recommended and then every time somebody recommends the book again to me i bump it up take it off that shelf bump it up to the two x shelf take it off the two x shelf bump it up to the three x shelf and then i'll only pick my next book to read off the three x shelf Okay. So I have a huge list, but by the time it's to the 3X shelf, it's actually a short list, and it's easy for me to skim and pick something and then go to the library. That makes no, – no. oh, we're going to fight. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, library, yeah. Lisa. Library. Uh, I, have, I have very strong opinions on that one. <laughs> actually, I'm going to digress real quick. Uh, there's, I can't cite my source on this before we go way down the library rabbit hole. Um but there, there was a, a case of, I think it was music industry. It may have been another field where this product entered the market at X price and would not move, would not move. And, and this sounds, this sounds uh, like a peril, but it's not. This was a real life situation. Entered the market, X price, would not move. Uh, and someone finally came to the, the, the company owner and said, you need to raise the price. Yes. And he's like, they're not moving at this price. He said, you need to raise the price. They raised the price by 50% and they sold out because yeah. the price dictated perceived value. Yeah, exactly. Like with guitar pedals, I definitely have had to struggle with that. Like, can I make, oh, I want it to get down to $99 because I do like a lot of charity work for uh, kids and the summer camps and they're like, learning their instrument and they're like trying to figure out what their first gear is going to be. So I want to make it as cheap as possible so that they could afford my stuff and have like premium gear. But again, it's the same thing. I'm not taking into account how long it takes to make and things like that. And like, if I'm making a Ferrari, sell it for a Ferrari price. And then someday when I'm real big, when I'm JHS, I can, you know, scale it down and have a mass market one. And if I can't, have a cheap pedal then donate my time that's hey, there you go exactly and and that's the thing if you're going to put in the effort you're going to build this quality product it's it's one thing if you're doing it a certain way especially with yours because they they look cool uh they're made well um it it can it can bring that slightly more premium price but yeah. you're, if well, you they're build... made a little too well unfortunately <laughs> I, 
after working with Mythos, Mythos for the past couple weeks, like I realized, all right, how much time I'm wasting doing all these little tasks to the pedal, like aligning the face plate, and then I tighten every nut by hand, every solder joint is just me, and then even cutting the wires, it takes too much time. All right, so you guys, you all of you listeners, you 40 Waters heard it here first. Buy your uh, Rutech pedal yes. now before he starts going cheap on the production. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, I'm going to get boutique pre-cut ones. <laughs> <laughs> but no, and so I'm going to, I think I've got my information right, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. And this this feels weird to say in today's market. This it used to be everyone in the, the pedal market making pedals was an electrical engineer or someone schooled at doing this, these guys who created it. And a lot of times they weren't even musicians. Look at Leo Fender when he created the, the, yeah. the guitars and the amps that he created. He wasn't even a musician. There's a great story about the, the guys in the shop would have to tune his guitar to open E because they got tired of hearing him just strum and open guitar. We're not right. playing chord while he's tweaking amps, but you have a background in electrical engineering. Yeah, I mean, ever since I was a kid, like I was telling you before we started, I built my first guitar pedal when I was like 12. That's so and crazy. I etched it out of a pattern, like an iron-on pattern that I tore out of the back of a Popular Mechanics. <laughs> and like had to etch the circuit board myself, which now I know people do all the time. But like back when I was doing this in like 1996 or 1997, you couldn't just go on the internet and have a forum say, Oh yeah, get ferric chloride from Radio Shack or something, and then you can, uh, then you can etch a circuit board pretty quick. Like you had to really figure it out. Yeah. Which I'm trying to avoid for like I sell kits on the site, and I'm trying to avoid people having to learn everything from scratch. But uh, yeah, when I was a kid, I built that little um, fuzz pedal, and then eventually just really liked it, and just thought it was magical when I would open up toys or stuff or like those lego things that had robotic arms and you'd yeah. rip it open and you'd see these green circuit boards inside and i thought oh that's cool that's what i want to do so that's so awesome actually i only recently discovered you do the kits because emily harris with the get offset podcast yeah. just put up a video of, of either she was working on one or actually i don't know if she got it completed in the video because i didn't finish the video i just started it and then like everything else in life something got interrupted me and i never came back to it but <laughs> Um, yeah, I realized you make uh, kits that you sell on your site. Yeah, uh, they are. I See, I didn't even know that um, she had bought a kit. Or we weren't talking yet at the time. And I, uh, we've since like chatted over Instagram a couple times. But she made the order, and I was like, man, how do I know this name? How do I know this name? <laughs> oh, well, send it off. And then I see her post about it. I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah, oh, cool. The podcast people that I like. I sent an order to them. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's very cool. So I'm going to watch that. And and kits are another way I've been getting into um, building pedals. And, and this is actually a good segue into. So um, I don't mind telling people when we record things. We're actually recording this on a Saturday. And, and I post on Thursday, which, by the way, at U40 Waters means that um, this is the earliest I've probably prepped an episode since I started the podcast. <laughs> I, I love it. It's going to be great. I'm not going to be stressing on Wednesday night nice. about the podcast out. But um, so that means uh, the pedal movie came out just a little over a week ago. It came out eight days ago. Now, by the time the podcast comes out, it'll have been, it'll been out almost two weeks. But um, we got to talking about those popular mechanic magazines and how um, Craig Anderson used to write those articles for popular mechanics. And then he went over to guitar player and started writing those articles for them. Uh, I learned all of this a week ago in the movie. And uh, then he wrote the book for you YouTube list, uh, watchers. You can see it. Uh, Electronic Projects for Musicians. Um, what a great book. This like I've been wanting to get into pedal building for a long, long time. Um, I, I was telling you before we started recording, uh, one of one of my Patreon supporters, uh, shout out Kyle. He likes when I shout him out, so I'm going to call him nice. out. Uh he works for, I won't name the company he works for, but he works for a pretty big tech company uh, doing analog style circuit stuff. And um, he and I have talked a whole bunch. He knows a couple of pedals that I have in my head that I want to be able to produce and make. Um, but I, I can't because I've only ever just replaced a part here and there in pedals. And so 
um, my plan is to get through this book in the next few months, build the circuits that are in this book. And then I've got some pedal ideas that I want to sort of get out there. Even if nice. the only thing that ever happens is I use them because I promise you, I have no interest in starting a pedal company. <laughs> that sounds like such a, like the competition. I say competition. Oh man, it's so crazy. There's so many companies. companies. Yeah. Like I am learning. On my Instagram, Instagram.com slash 40 watt podcast. I hear if you repeat these things, people will go follow them. So um, you really should follow my Instagram because, you know, I'm, I want to start doing uh, giveaways at some point. So if you don't follow the Instagram, you're not going to get in because I don't do an email list. Um, but I, I get new pedal companies following me almost every day. Companies I've never heard of that I didn't know existed at all. And suddenly they're here. They're, they're just popping up like crazy. I remember when I first started getting back into this game, because I talked about it in earlier episodes, I played the same pedal board roughly for like 10 years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and then in 2017, I decided, okay, I, I had moved. I had moved away from all the musicians I had been playing gigs with, and so I wasn't gigging. And so I didn't have that regular gig thing happening to, to kind of fuel my music, uh, musical scratch that itch. So I started, got into pedals, and then I was like, where did all these companies come from? Because <laughs> like when I stopped really looking at pedals, like the boutique companies were like Full Tone and Robert Keeley and yeah. ZVEX. And that was it, you know, like the, the ZVEX super hard on was still like the shit. Like that was still the pedal everybody talked about when I stopped looking. And now I don't, I haven't seen a super hard on on a pedal board in ages. So you know, I guess, yeah, I guess I haven't either. Uh-uh, they vanished. People are always tagging me their uh, pedal boards and stuff, so I always, like, look through them and save them in, in a little Instagram folder. And, uh, yeah, I guess I haven't either. Yeah, it's it's nuts how much it shifted in the last 10 years. Uh, and so I, I have no interest in trying to start a pedal company, make, <laughs> make a design, somebody else can put it out. I don't care. I just yeah. I, I want to build and make it and know what I'm doing there uh but it's it's the best possible time uh like i said i work in a library so we get tons of uh we get tons of book donations and sometimes they don't get added to our collection and so they go to our friends of the library organization to get sold in our book sale and uh i told you i was gonna bring up books so i've got the craig anderson yes. i paid full retail on amazon for that and i have a feeling the amazon price had gone up a little since the movie had released by the time i bought it mm. but um Sometimes you get really, really fun books that come in the library that that aren't good, that get sold in the book sale, like electronic devices, textbooks. Yeah, that's sick. Or Dude, the the book that I all right, I'm moving all the YouTube people get a treat, but the book that I'm balancing my uh, <laughs> microphone on this is a book from 1942 about high frequent or er, ultra high frequency techniques for electronics oh, and it's it's just like real like all the type looks very uh typewriter written and uh all, you look through all the circuits and you realize oh these are all tube circuits oh this dude is, that's sick. this is rad yeah or like uh introduction to electronic electric circuits nice just i mean these are textbooks i live in starkville mississippi which means that there is a uh, Mississippi State University here is here and they've got a big electrical engineering program. So we get textbooks donated a lot of times by retiring professors who are, mm -hmm. don't need them anymore. But uh, here is a phone. We're talking about old books. Um, so I've got this one. Um, transistor circuit designs. Oh. And it is. From the engineering staff of Texas Instruments. Rad. Yeah. And lastly, uh, I haven't gotten to this one yet. <laughs> Applications of operational amplifiers, third okay. generation techniques. Cool. I see you, uh, application of operational amplifiers, and I raise you op amps and linear integrated <laughs> circuits. That is awesome. From yeah. This one's 1983. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, you know, I haven't even looked at the year of these books. Um, but yeah, this is all the stuff that I've got because I want to learn to do it. But like, there's a learning curve just to get into these books that I think the Craig oh, Anderson yeah. book is going to help me bridge that that knowledge gap. 
This one is 1973. And yeah, I got this one electronic circuits and applications. This is 1975. Oh, that's see, that's we're getting close to the golden age here. <laughs> and this, uh, this Texas instrument book is from oh, that's from 63. That one will be nice thing to see what's not relevant anymore, but neither here nor there. That was a, that's a fun little rabbit hole. There's so many books out there, guys. Go to your public libraries and go to their friends of the library book sales. You will find gold in the book sales. I mean, these books cost me 50 cents each. Like, yeah. friends of the library have the best sales. So, And, like, I'm, worst case scenario, you could put them on a coffee table and put a little miniature cactus on them. Like, what are you waiting for, you weirdos? Exactly. Fill your house. Fill your houses with real books, please. <laughs> please fill your houses with real books because ebooks don't smell good. So, no, that's true. No, you that said that you were like, you feel like there's a learning curve getting into those books. I think for you, the learning curve would be filled by just taking a few broken pedals and trying to repair them. Yeah, that's that's what I'm I'm looking to do. I'm I'm going to go through this book, and I'm also you know I've got a couple of uh, searches on Reverb saved. Uh, one of them is has the keyword "broken" in it, or yes. it's a non-functional search. You can search for non-functioning as well. Uh, they have a category for non-functioning. Oh, that's cool. The other is I have a search set up for the word lot, just L O T. Nice. And so it means my feed is full of parts lots and like weird little groupings of things. So I see a lot of junk. But every now and again I find something really cool. Like I've got I've got some uh I want to build a fuzz. I'm gonna build a fuzz at some point because I know it's like one of the most basic circuits you can build. And I've got some some Telefunken BC 109s sitting around that I bought off uh, Reverb yeah. for a great price. That's uh, really what it takes. Find your unique thing. Like you'll stumble across something and then you'll find something that you can fit it into. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I, you know, shout out to a couple of other pedal makers out there who do that kind of thing, like um, low sounds, uh, the stuff oh, yeah. stuff they're making out of found parts. I mean, out of like, little baby monitors there or answering machines they're they're building some cool circuits into just whatever they can find and they salvage parts and they do some yeah. really really awesome stuff um there's another guy i'm really into eric brainia with brainia effects i don't know if you've seen i did a demo of one of his pedals i got one of his fuzzes i plan on getting a few more too um i've become a fuzz junkie as i've gotten older and i had to learn um but so he does the same thing. Like he doesn't have a standard enclosure. He finds cool enclosures and decides to build a limited run based on the enclosures he finds. So See, that I could never do that. Cause again, <laughs> I can't, I can't make things look pretty. So if I have to do it over and over again, I would, I would be so screwed. It would take up all my time. <laughs> well, that's why. And you were talking about sort of like the industrial design of like those old Russian, you know, like, yeah, it's very industrial. That's why I like this one. Like, it's ah, of course it's not. I like the uh, I like the print around the uh, the dial. It's so shiny. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's very much. It just goes from zero to a hundred. It's I think it's very basic, like uh, industrial like parts. There's nothing like that was designed specifically for this pedal. It's a it's a piece yeah. of metal that's on there. I like the amp jewel for LEDs. Uh, <laughs> he complains they take up too much space inside the pedal. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess yeah, that's fair. But listen, you got to give them what they want. Exactly. But uh, and it's it's similar. I get a, we get attracted to good looking pedals. It's why it's why I got into yours because they look badass. Thank you. So it's, yeah, those toggle guards actually it was exact same thing, just a weird lot on uh, eBay, and uh, their actual. It's a company that's an aerospace company that makes control panels for uh, like kit airplanes or okay. uh, Hollywood like uh, props. Like the Batmobile uses these same. I think the, Bat <laughs> the Batmobile from Batman Beyond and After uh -huh. use the same toggle guards that my three muff has. <laughs> so it's they're like actual aerospace uh, toggle guards, and I was like, oh. I can't pass it up. You know, this guy is so weird. You have to call him on the phone and he'll like send you just a big bag of them. And like, it, it's, it's hard to deal with him. 
you know, old school having to actually call someone to order something like yeah. just do it online no that's wild so uh, for those that don't i i may incorporate uh one of these pedals in the image in instagram so that people have something to reference back to if you're listening to this episode and you're wondering what we're talking about first of all uh, find Jesse and Rude Tech and buy a pedal. Seriously, they're super cool. They sound great. I know we've talked about how they look. They sound fantastic. The only Thank reason I so haven't much. bought one yet is because I want one of the muffs. And then I also know I'm not a muff player. We've talked about this on Instagram. I just, I am uh, like the fuzzes I'm really, really into are your typical like fuzz face tone bender like stuff. Yeah. That's what I'm super into. You get into the muff because I'm a, because I'm a blues and roots player they kind of get lost in that sound. There's not really, well, uh, it really is different. It's, yeah. it's all the tone stack too. Like it has such a weird, like on one end of the spectrum, it's just a bass boost. And on the other end of the spectrum, it's a bass, complete bass cut. And you're hearing only treble. And then when it, the knob is at perfectly 12 o'clock, you hear the treble and bass, but there's a huge mids cut. And it's yeah. not really designed to be like that. It's just, you know, they wanted to make two simple filters and sweep between them. And it just so happens they cancel out at like <laughs> 780 uh, kilohertz or hertz or something. I yeah. don't know. Whatever. Kilohertz. Yeah. But I think it is hertz. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, uh, it's been a long day. It's no, it's okay. it's okay. It's a building day for me. Every Saturday I have to build up my inventory for the week. So my brain is fried. No, I feel it. Uh, and I think that's also why I haven't really gotten into muffs. I'm a Fender amps guy. Like this, this yeah. podcast is called the 40 watt podcast because of how much I love super reverbs and you know, uh, Oh, a vibra lux. Yeah. Um, I think vibra verb, vibra lux, all those like around that 35 to 45 watt area of Fender amps. That's to me, that's the best sounding amps out there. Um, but they have a mid scoop and um, you add a muff to it and you scoop even more of those mids out. And then it's just, it's yeah. wash. It's wash at that point. You just get, the you might like it with a, a tone bypass. Cause okay. if you just bypass the tone stack completely, it sounds like a really open, uh, not transparent, but a really, uh, I don't know, even, uh, sound so like if you if you play bass and you want to hear the pick attack but you don't want to lose a lot of your low end just do the tone bypass and you can still get that little clicky uh sound without completely disappearing from the mix okay no yes that sounds more up my alley it's yeah number one mod i would do to any muff is just do the tone bypass and then let my preamp or the amp itself handle my eq oh see okay uh, that would, I, cause I've had, I've bought muffs like over the years. I've I had a, one of the nanos. I've had a couple of the big box. Um, I've had, oh, it's, it's, it's been a while since, cause like, you know, my, my late teens, early twenties, we were all, you know, like really into, uh, smashing pumpkins like everybody else. Was. And, and so, uh, which is crazy. Cause it's so not my, it's not a normal music I'd listen to. Actually, it's really funny. A couple of I guess about two years ago, I was going through some Facebook feeds uh, and a friend of mine posted a picture of Billy Corgan in Clarksdale at my hometown. He like recorded oh, yeah. a video for his social media on the train tracks like that I used to walk across all the time. I was like, that's really weird. Why? Yeah, that's wild. I never, I never counted Billy Corgan as the guy who would go down like the blues tourist trail. You know what I mean? <laughs> but sure enough, he he did. So uh uh, my hometown tends to randomly Clarksdale tends to get random people show up who just want to go to, you know, America's roots where blues music came from. And so it's wild. Like uh was going through town and uh John Krasinski was randomly walking across the street. In, really? Yeah. It's it's a weird place to be, man. Clarksdale's Clarksdale's such a cool, weird town like that. So um it was it was you know, like I think I, I talked about with Joe Branton, like when I moved to Nashville, Clarksdale wasn't being like, I didn't know how important Clarksdale was to American music. And I grew up there, but I moved to Nashville and everybody in Nashville that was in music knew about Clarksdale. I'm like, really? I have no idea about Clarksdale. Yeah, it, it's so Clarksdale is uh, there. There is a there's even a pedal named after Clarksdale. Wampler makes a Clarksdale overdrive pedal. Oh. 
it, it's it's a tube screamer, but it is definitely Clarksdale, like where I'm from, because it's got the Highway 49 and 61 logo on it, which mm-hmm. is the crossroads where Robert Johnson supposedly sold his soul to the devil. Oh, yeah. that's Clarksdale. Well, probably Ish. not. <laughs> yeah. It, oh, it, interesting. That's okay. what we say. Like, the, the intersection of 61 and 49, where there's a big marker for the crossroads, yeah. did, not, did not exist when Robert Johnson was You're alive. You're blowing my mind. You're yeah. kidding me. That, that, that <laughs> intersection did not exist. Um, you mean it wasn't all just dirt roads? No. <laughs> so actually, it probably was just a dirt road. And there is a place near like south of Clarksdale, closer to Cleveland, called Dockery Farm. It's where Charlie Patton was from. Another one of those seminal blues figures that kind of started the Delta blues genre. Um, there's a crossroad there that's probably more likely if Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil, quote unquote, that would have been more like where he did it. Um, technically, Robert Johnson never claimed to have sold his soul to the devil. Everyone else said it about him. Tommy Johnson, on the other hand, no relation, told everyone that he sold his soul to the devil to be able to play guitar the way he did. Yeah. And Tommy Johnson is the guy portrayed in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? So, and a lot of people made the assumption who aren't really into blues music. They were like, oh, Tommy Johnson, that's just an allusion to Robert Johnson. No, 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 no. Tommy Johnson was a blues musician. That's who they're alluding to, who told everybody he sold his soul to the devil. Yep. It's crazy. Get the credit for it, huh? Exactly. But Clarksdale is where Ike Turner's from, Sam Cooke is from, oh. John Peter, Muddy Waters, um, Jack, uh, Old Man Johnson. There's another guy I love. Named James Super Chicken Johnson. He's still active. He's he's a re- he's a relatively new scene kind of guy. But yeah, all these folks came out of Clarksdale, uh, and so they built this hub of of the roots of American music. And so, like at one point, W. C. Handy, the father of the blues, lived there. Robert Johnson even was there for a little while. He was not from there. He's from way further south. But um. So it was this like really, really important place. And in the 20s, Clarksdale and in the teens, Clarksdale was this big hopping town with tons of money. It's where uh, all the blues musicians stopped through to play. Uh, and, and it's got a it's got a country scene too. Conway Twitty's from like nearby in Friars Point, Mississippi. Charlie mm-hmm. Pride's from not too far away. Um, originally, it's it's a weird, weird like crucible of American roots music. Because the people who created all this music were poor. And because, you know, no great lasting work of art was ever created out of privilege. That's a that's a <laughs> controversial point. But, I, I, you know, it's just the way it is. So, anyway, that's my Clarksdale diatribe. I've gone down my rabbit hole. Um, so, yeah, when I moved to Nashville, people told me things about my own hometown that I didn't know. Yeah, I was, I was, at, I was in Murfreesboro, actually, at MTSU. And, um, oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's okay. Uh, it, was, it was a different town there in the mid 2000s than it is now. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I went back recently. Uh, we went back. Uh, a guy that I went to MTSU with has become a notable songwriter. His name is uh, Sean McConnell. He's a killer songwriter, killer singer, guitarist. Um, and my wife and I went up to see him play at the basement East. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we decided to stay in uh Murfreesboro, just because I had not been back in 15 years. And I was like, oh, I want to go check it out, you know, see what I remember. See, what... It's a different place. It's doubled yeah. the population and it's just insane. I heard it was the restaurant uh, capital of the U.S. Like there are more restaurants <laughs> per capita than anybody. Then there's more restaurants per capita in Murfreesboro than any other city in the U.S. I would not be surprised because so even we went out there, there were too many. <laughs> we <won. laughs> but Nashville, Nashville is Crane City now. Um, yeah, yeah, it's nuts. Nashville. Um, Nashville. I'm hopefully going to be up in Nashville if Summer Nam happens. I'm going to be up there. It's been a been a minute, but actually, I was there February just before the tornado came through last year. So, uh, oh, for wow. for a library conference. So, yeah, <laughs> nice. Literally, I left town the day before the tornado hit. Yeah, (laughs) it was good timing for me. Terrible for Nashville, but well, my house literally one block west of me was completely leveled. Or wait, hold on, which one makes the L (laughs) west? One block west of me was completely leveled, 
but I live in this house that, I mean, it might as well be made of, oh, hopefully my landlord doesn't listen. All right, Seth, if you're listening, turn off the podcast right now. <laughs> my house is made out of matchsticks. It sucks. And there are spiders <laughs> all over. And, you know, it it was totally fine. Like, not a shingle moved. Like, some branches fell in my yard. That's it. That's the wildest thing about tornadoes, man. How pinpoint they can be yeah. with the damage they do. Uh, my wife lived here in Starkville in 2009, 2010, something like that. She was attending Mississippi State, and she lived in a trailer park. I'm sorry, sorry, a mobile home community. Mm-hmm. She, she's told me they had their, they had a community swimming pool. It made it a mobile home community, not a trailer park. Hello, so boys. There's, there's no shame in trailer parks, y'all. Um, so she that tornado hit. She had nowhere to go. She rode it out in the trailer. The next morning, she came out. Her her deck was destroyed. Yeah. But her trailer was fine. Her neighbor on either side, gone. Whoa. Gone. Um, like they found a two by four with a pine needle driven through it. Yeah. It's That's crazy wild. what a tornado can do. And so her she was fine. Neighbor's gone. Yeah. It, insane. Uh, and they're scary because here in Mississippi and, and Tennessee understands this, obviously, but Mississippi, especially Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, um, Oklahoma can claim tornado alley if they want to Mississippi gets as many tornadoes as Oklahoma does. Oh yeah. Yeah. The difference is in Oklahoma, you can see them coming for miles. Yeah. <laughs> Mississippi, we have trees, so we yeah. don't see them coming. They sneak up on us. So it's 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 crazy terrifying weather we've had we had a tornado watch just the other day actually uh about a week ago not even a whole week ago now we had 19 tornadoes touch down in a day 19, in the of 19 across the state yes yeah. most of them small most of them didn't do a ton of damage some right. some did a whole lot of damage yeah it's 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 crazy how quickly they strike and out of nowhere yeah it, that's wild when the tornado here hit um, my girlfriend Zara, she was like, "We need to go into the bathroom, or we need to go somewhere." And I was like, oh, "I'm tired. I'm sleepy." <laughs> Meanwhile, there's like golf ball sized hail cracking against the window. I'm, like, oh, I'm sleeping. <laughs> and then we wake up in the morning, you know, and there's sirens going off. And we wake up in the morning. A whole n- big news today: a whole swath of Nashville has been knocked down from whatever. We need volunteers. What a clear brush. And Zara's just like, "That's my girlfriend." She's like. Next time I say we need to go to the bathroom, we are going to the bathroom. You <laughs> You're not sleeping through it next time. This is yes, very much. I understand. You win. This You're is right. very much conversations me and my wife have. <laughs> She's very much the okay. Helmets, mattresses, pillows. What inner room are we going to? Grab the you know the <laughs> flashlights, um, and I'm like, oh, wake me up when it's over. <laughs> yeah, it's it's bad. It's rough, but. I mean, it's the whole, if it's my time, it's my time kind of (laughs) philosophy. I'm comfortable right now. Yeah, there you go. I also have this fantasy in my head where, like, if the house starts to creak or something, like, I could roll off the bed real fast and then roll back the other way, and all of a sudden I'm under the bed and I'm safe somehow. I don't know. (laughs) Like, I can ninja myself out of harm. I think that's I think that's flawed logic, but I'm with you. I'm totally with you. Like <laughs> that sounds like my logic. It's like, no, I'll find a way. We'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this this is how people die in tornadoes, unfortunately. Because yeah. it's they are they shouldn't be played with. We shouldn't talk too light of them, but you know, what can you do? I mean, there's yeah, there's, no, there's no protection from it. I mean, you can you can have safe rooms or whatever you can get in the inner room of your house, but unless you have like a dedicated storm shelter, it's still a dice roll. Um, yeah. If it can rip a roof off of your house, like, I don't know. It doesn't maybe, care what room you're in. Precautions. Yeah. It doesn't care what room you're in. <laughs> it really <laughs> doesn't. Um, but yeah. Uh, and that was so basement, the basement, which was one of my favorite venues there in Nashville got completely destroyed. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think I saw on social media their staff only made it into a seclu- a covered area, like a protected area, like sixty seconds before the entire structure got demolished. Yeah, from what I understand, they were all in the green room, like they oh. just got everybody. But yeah, the next day, because like everybody turned out for volunteers, and like there was like Nashville direct action on Instagram, and like 
telling people what was needed and where like big ear pedals even uh messaged me he was like this is gonna be a great impression by the way <laughs> uh hey jesse what's up this is a fantastic impression oh my god i'm so impressed with myself hey uh we got all these uh we got all these vegan hot dogs. I thought maybe, uh, like, if you know where they're being, uh, like, distributed to workers, uh, things like, so, like, if you could just tell me where that is and figure it out, like, I can drop them off or give them to you and you could drop them off. And I was going down to volunteer. And uh, so I just started texting people. I was like, okay, where did you set up the booth? Where's everybody volunteering? Where's the cooking thing? And uh, Nashville direct direct action took care of it. And they were like, all right, show up here and we're going to, we're going to fry them up. And I was like, they're vegan. Is that okay? And they're like, that's fantastic. Everybody here is like, yeah. you know, touchy feely granola eating, want to help people, people. So of course they're vegan. So yeah. it really, really helps to have some vegan hot dogs. And oh, that's, are new wow. that. oh that's very cool. Yeah. And, and also that's, that's, uh, a pretty pretty decent Grant impersonation. For, I've never met Grant, but I've Thank I've seen him talk. Uh, I've I've heard him on podcasts before. So, uh, Grant, if you don't appreciate that impersonation, well, uh, come on the podcast and and <laughs> show everybody what you really sound like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but prove me wrong. Yeah, pr prove Jesse wrong. I dare you. I double dog dare you. So, um, this is this is really how I get people to come on the podcast. Is, is I just you know peer pressure. Yeah, peer pressure. I tell them what other people are talking. <laughs> <laughs> just, just wait till I have Zach on. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it'd be great. Um, yeah. So, but it looks like you know it. It didn't help that a tornado came through just as everything's shutting down for a pandemic. Exactly. The tornado was March, early, early March, March first, or something like that. And yeah. And then the pandemic shut down was like March fourteenth, fifteenth. Yep. Something like that. That's about right, because I shut the we shut our libraries down on the seventeenth. Mm -hmm. uh, the sixteenth was the day we started to realize uh, we may need. Wait to Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. something's going on. It, everything hits Mississippi a little late, so. Well, here the tornado hit, so we were already out of toilet paper. Like, like yeah. I can't underestimate. I can't stress to you enough how much of East Nashville was just like shut down. Like, if you there was no damage, but the streets around you would be completely shut down yeah. and like everybody just knew, all right, you're not going to work. You're probably helping your neighbors. You're probably picking up debris out of the street. So like, what did everybody do? They bought as much toilet paper as they could. And then all the, then we get yeah. the lockdowns and it's like, well, what are we going to do? If you didn't buy <laughs> toilet paper in February, uh, I'm sorry, man. See you at the crossroads. That's it. Yeah, exactly. You're you're really up a creek. At, shit, you're up shit creek at that point. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Uh, so funny. Um, but yeah, it's. It, I still don't understand. I'm not never gonna understand. There's been enough memes about it that I don't need to rant about it. But I don't get the toilet paper thing. That just yeah. never made sense to me. Why go out and hoard toilet paper? It, it just. And it, it it's right up there with I really want to understand buying milk and bread for snowstorm. Yeah. Like, I can't remember the last time I drank milk, but if there's a snowstorm coming, I better get some <laughs> bread. I better get some white bread, which I haven't eaten since I was 13. Right. I better get a big gallon of milk. <sighs> yeah, I, I, I'm, an, I'm an almond and oat milk guy, so I don't even, you know, nice. buy regular milk. Um I don't do bread at all anymore. So it's like, I, we never have bread in the house. So it's like, I, we're fine. <laughs> Nobody's buying <laughs> up all the oat milk. So we're good. But it's, it just, none of that makes sense to me in, 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 in disaster times, but it's what people do. It, luckily it looks like we're starting, starting to come out of it a little bit. Maybe yeah, just I'm a, very stoked. Yeah. I'm like, excited. I was just hanging out with people last night. Like we were, we realized we were all vaccinated and we we're like, wait a minute. So when was your second shot? Oh, wait a minute. So your immunity day was April 30th. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. So we're, we're, we've all been fully vaccinated and we were like outside in the backyard. Like, wait a minute. And we're just like, I'll take off our masks. Like, oh, is, is this okay? This feels dirty. Oh my yeah. God. I, we all can like hang out like normal people. This is weird. I went on a, I went on a mild rant on my episode last week, uh, it may it may make some people angry at me and some people may sympathize. Nice, here we go. Yeah, well, it's just that it's about the whole 
and and I don't want to seem like they're they're the mask thing and like getting comfortable again. Like it's weird because I re I I'm starting to feel what maybe some people felt a little earlier about the mask. They're exhausted of the masking thing. Like, and I am exhausted of it. I'm so tired of it. And as you know, cities and counties are lifting it. And now that vaccines are more readily available, it's like we're all having to sort of start to find the point where we're comfortable as a society to start taking the mask off, you know? Yeah. And it's clear uh, rules from the CDC would have yeah. helped. Like, yeah, exactly. Would have really, really helped because instead we're all just kind of having to feel it out. It's like, and they're putting that stuff out. It's just like, you know, maybe break it down. I'm not going to read a PDF of seven scenarios that the CDC put out. Give me, Hey, you're indoors. Hey, you're outdoors. Yeah. Hey, you you're in a big crowd, even though you're outdoors and then that's it. Yeah. Just break it down so that we really, really understand. Um, and it, at some point, the other, the other side of it is, you know, how long do we as a society, especially for those of us willing to go get vaccinated, um, and, and to protect those of us who can't get vaccinated. Uh, I'm not talking about those that are choosing not to get vaccinated just because they just don't want to. But there are people who legitimately can't get vaccinated. So those that can need to do it for the protection of those that can't. Uh, those with immunocompromised uh, systems and things like that. At what point do we sort of go, okay, everyone sort of needs to take responsibility for themselves in it now you know the, the vaccines are available you've got a chance like i'm i i'm having a hard time even wording it's like because i'm ready like so many to go back to life as normal but we don't have a cl clear idea of what that looks like or when it can yeah. because there's so many things about it like even in situations where i know i can take my mask off right like for example, I have a staff meeting with the library staff and all of us are vaccinated. So we'll take our masks off. It still feels weird to do it. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's well, so I think a lot of that is we're so close to the end. It's like a road trip. OK, follow me with this. Here we go. Ready? Let me take you on a spin. It's like a road trip. I should have thought this ahead. It's like <laughs> a road trip and you got to go to the bathroom, right? Right. I can hold it for an hour if I have to. If we're making good time, I can hold it. We're fine. But as soon as I see the exit for the rest stop, I start getting antsy. I'm like, all right, come on. Okay, where is it? Where? What parking spot am I going to pull into now? Okay, so everybody, who's yeah. going to take the keys and lock the car? Is anybody going to get a drink? Because i got to go to the bathroom real quick. And you get real antsy. We're at that point in the pandemic where we're almost there. Yep. Let's just make it to the bathroom. I mean, to herd immunity. <laughs> It's a fantastic wait, wait a analogy. It's a, it's a fantastic analogy. I, I am 100% on board. Uh, we're getting really close to the toilet. Y'all just hold yeah, on. We're almost there. We're just getting a little antsy. So, you yeah. know, maybe maybe take a woo-saw, maybe sit down for 10 minutes and take a deep breath. And Yeah. In a, in a month, it's going to look totally different even. Like, yeah. And, even and just actually, a month. That's the way I felt about Mississippi lifting the the mask ordinance and even our uh, the county I'm in finally lifted their county and city mask ordinances. Um, I genuinely feel like it was about a month premature. I feel like yeah. I, I, I think it's that close. I think it's a month, maybe two at the most, because at this point, uh, vaccine rollout's been pretty decent. It could be better. Could have obviously could have been better. Everything can be better. But um they're available. They're out there in a ton of places. I felt like one more month, one more month, like trying to make people do it. Cause you know, the people still aren't doing it that, that mm. even when you had an ordinance. So anyway, I'm going to get off the depressing topic. <laughs> I did. I look y'all. Uh, this is episode 22 of the podcast. I did really, really well. I started this <laughs> pandemic. I've done really well not talking about the pandemic but the last two episodes you can tell it's that whole i know i, I gotta pee i gotta pee real bad so. it's because we're antsy it's like starting to creep into all the things that we think are fun now too it's just like hey yeah it's time right yeah exactly right, guys? gigs are starting to line up for me again so i'm having to think yeah, more about being shows. in public and so it's and and like I said, you know, hopefully summer Nam happens. I I want to go. It's I've gonna happen. Nam. It's for sure gonna happen. Yeah, it's. I'm it's not, this is gonna be the first year that I don't exhibit though. Oh, is it? Yeah. Awesome. I, you're, you're gonna go though, right? You're gonna go hang out. Man, honestly, I don't know. 
I just, cause like I have a bunch of people that I message on Instagram now and it's just like, Oh, all the people that we used to see at Nam and, uh, dealers from stores that I like and like, well, I mean, if you're going to be in town, let's go out to dinner or something. Let's meet up yeah. at Eastside music supply or something. Yeah. Let's do a party. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, yeah. I don't know if I'm going to walk the trade show floor this year. I don't blame you. I've, I've never been, so I'm going to walk, you know, brand new podcast, all those things. So I'm going to walk the trade show, try to hand out some business cards to some people oh, that definitely. Have never even look at it, those kinds of things. But, um, I'm going to, I'm going to try it's to a great way to get uh podcast guests from what I understand, like yeah, premier guitar and you know, every podcast will go through and just be like, Hey, here's my, I want to have you on the show. If you can find a spare hour, like let's hang out. Yeah, exactly. And that's and what I'm if you pass the weirdo test, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'm, I'm fucked. <laughs> I pass the weirdo test. Yeah. That's you and me. <laughs> but I tell you what, I'm going to be, well, I will be in Nashville at that time. Uh, I've got a, I'm staying with a bunch of other podcasters. You know how that goes. We, we all cut the cost by getting, getting someplace to stay. And, uh, uh, you can at least come out, have some hot chicken. That's our goal. Get we we we've, we've got a couple of places lined up now. Our goal is to find, Where are you going to go. Um, so I'm a big believer in princes. And yes, baby. Yes. I'm a big prince yes. believer. That's, that's the, to me, that's the bar. Uh, that's the best one. I see, I think so too. They disagree with me. They say it's um oh, oh, where is it? Oh, see, this is gonna be a, a problem. Oh, here we go. I can't remember it, but I'm gonna find it. You're Hold about on. to say Hattie B's. No, no. Luckily, none of us are on the Hattie B's train. Yeah, baby. Hattie yeah. B's is for weak mouth tourists. Yes. Um, so yeah, I said it. If you're a Hattie B's fan, you don't know what hot chicken is. Yes. That's all I'm saying. But secretly. Uh, I actually think it's pretty good. They put like a little brown sugar in it, but it definitely is hyped up. But yeah, it sucks. No, it's it's Prince's okay. is the best one. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, if we're if we're talking hot chicken, like specifically, we're talking hot chicken, and that's right. what I want. Hattie B sucks because it is yes. not hot chicken. Yeah, it, it can it get is. pretty hot, but it's not hot chicken, not like Prince's. Yeah. No, it's not like it should be. Now, if we're just talking good chicken, yeah, Hattie B's has it's good chicken. chicken. It's good yeah, chicken. I, so when I was at that conference in February last year, uh, it, it was at the Music Center, so it was downtown, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it'd be like, um, We were having lunch with me and a bunch of other librarians, uh, having lunch at this librarians. restaurant. Librarians. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, having lunch at this hotel, and like, they had hot chicken on the menu. I'm like, hmm, this hotel's got a kind of nice restaurant. We're going to find out. It was like I've had spicier chicken from Wendy's. Yeah. So bad. And so, like, I got really disappointed. But, um, okay, I'm going to find it now. They want to do, um, okay, here it is. Boltons. Yes. Yeah, I think Boltons that's is it. Chill. Boltons is chill. I like their, if you do go there, go get their catfish. Yeah, their that's hot, their hot fish yeah. is good. So we're going to get Boltons. We're going to get uh, Prince's because like all the podcasters I'm in this group with, they're like, no, no, they go to Boltons and they haven't had Prince's. I'm like, you haven't had Prince's? Like, yeah, Boltons is legit, but I mean, it's not Prince's. No, no, dude. The last time I got Prince's was at that conference. It was my last night there um, before I drove back the next morning. I had not had good hot chicken since I'd been there. And mm -hmm. so I went over to, oh, they they have a truck over by Yeehaw Brewing, like downtown, like near where I was staying. Mm -hmm. right? So, um, and it's a legit truck, but I think it's like a permanent truck location. Like they're not moving yeah. around or anything. And so um, went and got it, got the medium because I'm not, I don't hate myself. Um, <laughs> and it, medium is that perfect for me that border between t still tasting good and not being so not being a flamethrower. Oh yeah. It's hot. It's spicy. It's right on that threshold where if it were any hotter, it's not pleasurable anymore. It doesn't taste good anymore. Cause it's just, yeah. but like, I like hot food a lot, but hot food doesn't like me if you catch my drift. <laughs> yeah, so no. like when I would eat princes, it would be back when it was at its old location. Uh, yeah on Dickerson road, we could, I would go get it on a Thursday for lunch, call off Friday. And then <laughs> maybe by Monday, I'm feeling okay enough to go back to work. Oh, that's so like I had to really plan it out. And that was when I was getting mild or if I felt adventurous medium. 
Yeah. No, I, I read an article about uh, these, I think they were from New York. These guys from New York came down, they're food journalists. They came down and wanted to do hot chicken. And of course they, they actually interviewed Prince had her on there and like talked about the whole franchise, how it all got built and how they do their thing. Well, they're ordering the hot chicken to try it, to, to write about it. Right. And they're, they're, they don't hate themselves. So they're not going for hot, hot. They're going right. for like medium or mild. Uh, but one of them, <laughs> one of them asked, and this is the thing. If you're, if you're a listener, 40 waters and you've never had Nashville hot chicken, this is going to be a quick education about how hot chicken is different from probably what you're thinking we're talking about. They asked, um, but can we just get a small thing of the hottest sauce just to try? And the person in the no truck sauce. looked, yeah, looked at them and said, "There, there is no sauce. There's no sauce. This is cooked into the chicken. This is heat. This is it, it comes hot. There's no sauce on this chicken at all. It's yeah. it's just hot. And so it's not like you're thinking like, oh, this is just breaded buffalo sauce chicken. No, no, no. It's its own thing. Ah, yeah. now it's its own thing, and it's great. Yeah, now I, I had a friend who worked at a. Uh, hot chicken uh truck and they would hear rumors about another hot chicken truck this was in this was in bellevue in the 90s in the late late 90s and he was like yeah there's this other truck that is driving around but like they don't stop at the same place as we stop they don't i've never really seen them sell stuff but people go up to it all the time turned out it was a fake hot chicken truck that was a mobile meth lab (laughs) <laughs> and they were they were selling rock out of the hot chicken truck, and every once in a while they'd have people come up to it and be like, "Oh hey, uh, so what have you got? Like, is is a hot the same as like a prince's hot?" And they'd be like, "Oh, this isn't for you. <laughs> uh, we're close. We're uh, we're out of chicken." Oh my Sorry. god, that is so good. That is, <laughs> oh, that's that's Nashville right there. That's there. Nashville. That's the national nobody sees if they only go down Broadway in second. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, well, Jesse, I've, I've, I've held a whole bunch of your time on a building day. So uh, I think food talk is always a good time to, to wrap things up once we go down that rabbit hole, uh, much like Blake does on the Tone Mob. Uh, I, don't, I don't have any classic questions. We just like to talk food. Um, Guys, I really appreciate Jesse coming on. I, I'm going to put his links down below. I'm going to put his Instagram. I'm going to put where you can find his pedals, where you can check them out. Um, seriously, check them out. They're they're super well built. They're super cool. They're unique. You're not going to see another pedal that looks like it. Uh, and they, the sound is impeccable. Um, Thank you I'm, so much. I'm, I'm going to be getting them eventually soon. I'm, I've, I've, I did a big pedal purge earlier no, or late last year where I got rid of most of my stuff mm-hmm. and now I'm starting to build back up. I'm like just finding cooler stuff now is Oops. what I'm doing. So, so it's going to be, that works. Oh yeah. It's, it's hilarious how that works, but uh, <laughs> so be looking, looking for that order coming through at some point, it, it'll be this year. At least I can, I can only guarantee this year. Um, I gotta, I gotta quit buying things at some point. Um, also on the, the front of library versus library, uh, folks, if you're shaming people for the way they pronounce things, you really need to take a look at yourself and see what it actually says about you because uh, language yes. is ever evolving thing and it's always changing. And so, at some point you're going to have to accept that a pronunciation that you don't like is a standard pronunciation. That's just how it is. We don't pronounce the K in knife anymore, but at one point it was pronounced. Nobody's shaming you for that. Anyway, that's my rabbit hole. Librarians get really mad at me when I tell them you <laughs> have to accept library as a pronunciation for library. We yeah. took we took the extra R out of February. Why are you getting mad about library? Yeah, we're not all Welsh anymore. Exactly. <laughs> so anyway, I digress. We're going to wrap things up. I appreciate all y'all listening. Remember, uh, find us on social media, like and subscribe or uh, review and rate you can support the podcast at Teespring by buying some merchandise, or you can support us on uh, Patreon, and a quarter of that money does go to charity. I appreciate it. Y'all take it easy. Be good to yourselves. Be kind to each other, and try to make some noise. Yeah, real quick, let me yeah. plug a couple. There's this charity I work with called jessizazu.org, J-E-S-S-I-Z-A-Z-U.org. J-E-S-S-I-Z-A-Z-U.org. And you can and find the link below. They're doing a lot of cool stuff like I teach summer camps with them and that's what the ain't afraid kit is. Oh, 
that's the pedal that we build in that class for those kids. And uh, every kit I sell, I can donate another one to the uh, classes. And jessiezazu.org uh, raises money for uh, youth empowerment through arts and humanities and um, awareness of cervical cancer and things like that. So oh, that's outstanding. Check them out. They have a donate button right on their page if you want to check them yeah. out. And that, that link is below. So check that out. Click that. Support that. I'm all about charities, especially those that work with kids. It's why uh, this year's charity is St. Jude. I think next year my proceeds are going to go to the Delta Blues Museum Arts and Education Program that works with after-school programs for kids, teaching them music, things like that. They teach them to play bass and guitar and drums. Cool. Actually, a past guest of mine, uh, Christone Kingfish Ingram, uh, came through that program. My sister came through that program. Heck, I went through that uh, some of that program as a as an adult. I went in my twenties yeah. to go hang out and learn some blues from some classic blues guys. It's part of how I got into doing what I'm doing. So, y'all be sure to click that link below, jessiezazu.org, and uh, support some awesome cause. So we're gonna get out of here, and uh, y'all be cool. Later. See ya. Pretty good. Not, not bad for license.